help me welcome uh, Rajiv Suri, the CEO of Nokia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you back in one of my favorite cities in the world. I want to try something a bit different today. Uh, the, the title of my remarks, uh, as you can see, is Changing the World in a World of Change. So I originally thought I would focus on the future of 5G and digital transformation. And I will go there. It's just in my DNA at this point. But what I really want to do is take a step back and talk about the world in a much broader context, and not with a bunch of slides, charts, and graphs. After all, the global environment in which you are starting and building your businesses is not what it was 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, or even two years ago. So that context matters. We hear again and again from companies in this particular region of California that they are changing the world. Yes, it has become a valley cliche. And, and plenty of those claims are more hubris than fact. But some of them are actually true. The reality is that effective change is a worthy goal, particularly in today's world. But if you really want to change the world, you first need to understand the larger world around us. You need to understand the many big challenges we all face, uh, challenges crying out for solutions. These are things that no one company, no one government can solve. Collective effort is required, and many, many need to play a role. Sadly, the, the list of challenges is long. I'll focus on just four. I do so a bit warily because these challenges are the subject of intense political debates. And my intent is to try to stick to the facts and leave the politics to others. First, I think we can all agree that the global order, which has maintained stability since the end of World War II, uh, is under unprecedented threat. Uh, that stability, of course, has been imperfect and incomplete. Uh, we do not want to trivialize the experiences of the many countries and many people who have faced the ravages of war, terrorism, and unrest. But even with its flaws, the carefully maintained global balance of power, the presence of strong multilateral institutions such as NATO and the World Trade Organization, uh, the tight bonds formed by global trade, uh, the resulting increases in the standard of living around the world, have all served as stabilizing factors. Today, these are all being challenged. You can point to many causes. There remains deep income disparity in many parts of the world. We have seen an increase in nationalism, populism, and protectionism. And politicians who fuel divisions rather than show the leadership to solve them. There is the rise of China on the world stage, and the current self-interest-only approach of the United States. These are just a few of the causes, but they're all contributing to making the world a more dangerous and somewhat more uncertain place. My second topic, the persistence of global poverty. To be clear, the trends of recent decades have been remarkable. According to the World Bank, since 1990, nearly 1.2 billion people have lifted themselves from extreme poverty. At that time, more than one-third of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Today, the figure is down to about one-tenth. But we should keep a few things in perspective. First, extreme poverty is defined as purchasing power of less than $1.90 a day. So we obviously can have plenty of people above that level who remain in dire conditions. Second, the number of people still living in extreme poverty remains shamefully large. The estimates vary a bit, but the figure is somewhere around 700 million people, roughly the same as the entire population of Europe or double that of the United States. And finally, it is our problem. 
Sure, the data shows that poverty is increasingly concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. But one need only look out the window here in San Francisco to see a large homeless population. Right? This issue is literally in our doorstep. To put some facts around it, roughly 40 million people in the US live below the federal government's poverty threshold. That is one in seven Americans. It is even worse when you consider that one in every five children and one in every four adults, if you are black or Native American, is under that poverty threshold. In short, the problem is far from solved, despite meaningful progress over the past three decades. My third topic, health and well-being. As incomes rise, health and happiness also tend to rise. But that is not the whole story. There are plenty of other studies that show you can be well off economically, but still be miserable, still not get the health care you need, still feel alienated and disconnected. Consider a recent study about internal migration in China. It showed that people who moved from the countryside to cities typically doubled their income, but were less happy than those still living in rural communities. Clearly, money is not everything. Community is a big factor, as is health. Despite the right to health being enshrined in the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, at least half of the world's population cannot get essential health services. And about 100 million people a year are pushed into extreme poverty because they are forced to pay for expensive health care out of their own pockets. This is not just a developing world issue. Think about the United States, which spends about double the per capita average among developed countries on health care. And yet, the results are no better, and in some cases, worse. So again, money is not the only solution. We can, we must do better. My last topic, sustainability. For brevity's sake, I want to discuss just one issue that is core to sustainability, global warming. Here, let's call a spade a spade. Our planet is warming, and despite lots of noise on the topic, the overwhelming scientific consensus is that human activity is the primary cause of that change. I certainly believe this to be the case, but I'll leave it to you to come to your own conclusion. Regardless of the cause, however, the warming trend is clear. Globally, the average surface temperature has increased more than one degree Fahrenheit since the late 1800s. Most of that increase has occurred over just the past three decades. Every one of the past 40 years has been warmer than the 20th century average. 2016 was the hottest year on record. The 12 warmest years on record have all occurred since 1998. Serious stuff. The consequences are already severe and are expected to get worse in the coming years. Rising sea levels will put huge populations at risk, many of them in high poverty areas. The list of more destructive weather we can expect is long, including more intense hurricanes, uh, heat waves, longer droughts, and the resulting pressure on water supplies, disruption to food production, and effects on human health. Of course, you know this all too well living in California. The most recent spate of wildfires has been catastrophic due to the ongoing drought. The losses have been staggering and heartbreaking. Just as poverty is an issue that hits even rich countries, global warming does not discriminate. Nor is it just an issue for our children and grandchildren. A recent report commissioned by world leaders as part of the 2015 Paris Agreement suggests that our planet could be in crisis as soon as 2040. That is well within the lifetime of most of us in this room. I do not know about you, but I am certainly planning on being alive 22 years from now. And we have a responsibility to ensure that our planet is sustainable for the generations that follow. So, four big topics. The threat to our global order, poverty, health and well-being, and global warming. Now, you, you might wonder, why am I talking about these issues at a conference about technology-focused businesses? Or, if I'm a pessimist, given the scale of these challenges. In fact, I am an optimist. And I believe the work Nokia does, 
what technology companies do can make the world a better, healthier, fairer, and more sustainable place. At the start of my remarks, I accused the Valley of a bit of hubris. Now I guess you can accuse me of the same, because I believe quite deeply that both what we do in tech companies like Nokia and how we do it can make a real difference. Let me share some concrete examples. I will start with poverty, and I'll save the world order topic for, for later. Productivity growth is essential to addressing poverty, but it has slowed considerably since 1970. In fact, since then, it has fallen to about one-third the rate of the previous 100 years. Despite the major innovations in communications and uh, computing and other technologies since then. That is worrying to be sure, but I also believe the tide will start to turn once again. Our colleagues at Nokia Bell Labs have done some interesting work on this topic. They looked at the elements that combined to make earlier leaps in productivity growth possible. And they concluded that four physical networked technologies, all widely diffused and working in tandem, made the difference. And those technologies were in energy, transportation, health and sanitation, and communication networks. Today, we can see the digital version of those technologies coming to life, becoming widespread and, and working in concert with each other. And there is another foundational change underway. Digital production networks, which will result in a shift from centralized mass production to distributed and localized production facilities. Digital communication will provide the glue to bring these things together and enable the radical transformation of the former physical technologies. 5G, which we predict is a general purpose technology, will enable much of this. Yes, I, I said I would mention 5G, uh, but there are other enablers as well. High capacity optical networks, massive capacity routers, software that makes those systems work efficiently, many of the things that Nokia does and that those in this room do or will do as well. With these developments, we are predicting that the United States will see a major productivity jump in the range of 30 to 35 percent. That is big. It is similar to what this country saw during the 1950s. We should see it start somewhere around 2028 to 2033. This higher productivity rate could add trillions of dollars to the U.S. economy every year. Just to put that in perspective, if you took one trillion dollars and spread it among every American citizen, you could hand each a $3,000 check and still have $22 billion to spare. And, and while our initial analysis focused on the United States, the research indicates that its findings can be extrapolated to other countries as well, including China, uh, India, although the productivity rise may start a few years later there. In short, we can all play a role in reducing poverty. And yes, that really is changing the world. Now, health and well-being. On the health side, we see a world in which a highly connected digital healthcare system will supersede the physical constraints of a hospital or doctor's office. We were just talking about it in, in the Q&A before this. What was old will become new again with the return of the house call. It will be a digital one, possible whether the patient is on the other side of town or on the other side of the world. And rather than submit it to an annual physical to see if you are healthy, you will be able to have continuous monitoring of your health. That will turbocharge preventive health capabilities by diagnosing illnesses before they can spread. Add in some artificial intelligence to drive action from all the data crunching, as well as a few digital robots who serve as empathetic home health assistants. And the holy grail of lower costs, greater access, and better results has a true chance of becoming reality. This is not some future fantasy. Nokia Bell Labs has been hard at work to develop wearable devices like a sleeve that can capture and transmit a range of vital health data 24 by 7. We've also been working with the China Mobile Research Institute looking at 
what a 5G-enabled ambulance can do to improve care, especially in a life-and-death situation where every second counts. Imagine a person collapses on the street. The 5G sleeve quickly identifies and directs the closest ambulance to the scene. Inside the ambulance, equipped with a CT scanner and high-definition cameras, a complete body scan is done while en route to the hospital. In less than a second, all of that essential data, CT scan, video, EKG, and other vitals, each easily being hundreds of megabytes of data, are delivered wirelessly to the emergency room over a 5G network. Again, all in less than one second. The doctor at the hospital then confirms the diagnosis and secures an emergency room bed or an operating room as needed. So connectivity can indeed be the cure. In terms of well-being, I mean, think about smart cities. As the world becomes more densely populated, as more and more people live in large cities, there are serious questions being raised about the livability of those cities. The congestion, pollution, infrastructure, access to services, and much more are creating challenges on an unprecedented scale. If you take the example of China that I just mentioned, do we really want the growing number of urban dwellers to be less happy, and to feel less connected to community? We think that having cities become smarter can provide real solutions. So take the work we recently started with Viettel. This is a major telco in Vietnam. We created an integrated operation center for Hanoi's smart city services. These services make it easy for the government and other city providers to do things like detecting water leaks, uh, monitoring traffic, detecting pollution, uh, monitoring water quality, all helping to preserve precious resources and making the city more sustainable. In short, we can all play a role improving health and well-being. And again, that really is changing the world. When it comes to sustainability, there is so much we can do. We can make products that are good for business and good for the environment. Take, for example, Nokia's new base stations for mobile networks, which use about 45% less energy than the previous generation. We can vastly reduce fuel consumption through autonomous driving, smart electric vehicles, and automated truck platooning. We can build intelligent factories that reduce waste and harmful byproducts at every step of the process. This is coming to life at uh, Nokia's facility in Olu, Finland, where we are creating a conscious factory capable of adapting to meet new needs and deliver incredible efficiency. Elsewhere, we are working with Bosch, with Daimler, with BMW, and many others to transform manufacturing from the world of smokestacks to a world of smart bits and bytes. We can enable digital production, where the centralized factories of today get replaced by local micro factories enabled by 3D printing, robotics, and 5G networks. This would significantly reduce the environmental impact of transporting goods over long distances. Even where long-haul transportation is necessary, we can make it better for our planet. In Los Angeles, Hamburg, and Rotterdam, we are helping operators of large ports become faster and far more efficient, while also improving safety and security. And we're not just talking ports, improving productivity and efficiency and all kinds of logistics operations is far-reaching effects on energy efficiency. For example, Nokia is working with the world leader in delivery services with more than 500 hubs here in the US and another 400 around the world. We are creating a next generation, fully automated wireless network that encompasses voice, data, mobile, and IoT for tracking packages and vehicles in one seamless system. In short, we can all play a role in making our planet more sustainable. And yes, that really would be changing the world. Finally, to the topic of our global, or to our fracturing global order. Uh, there are no simple solutions here, no easy to describe you know, 5G-enabled technologies that will make things better. But there are things we can do. Building company cultures with strong values, with an emphasis on respect, ethics, and integrity, sets an example for others. At Nokia, we take 
great pride in our work in these areas. And the fact that we are constantly rated one of the world's most ethical companies and a great place to work. Decency, humanity, dignity, respect. I mean, these words should be as much a key part of our business vocabulary as strategy, margins, and revenue. Being aware of our impact on human rights is another area where we can help. Just think about Facebook and the allegations that its platform was used to spread hate speech and incite violence in Myanmar. A report from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights on that situation said companies, and I quote, should conduct in-depth human rights impact assessments for their products, policies, and operations based on the national context, and take mitigating measures to reduce risks as much as possible, unquote. This hit home. About a decade ago, Nokia unfortunately sold some equipment to a country that misused it. Today, we have a rigorous human rights due diligence process to ensure we maximize the benefits of the communication technology we provide while minimizing risks of abuse. Being fair is another step we can take, and a good place to start is when it comes to gender balance. Every company, and particularly those in technology, uh, need to take a hard look in the mirror. When you do that, you will mostly see men. And that is just not right. The journey to gender balance is challenging. And despite good progress, we are far from where we want to be at Nokia. But our commitment is there. In short, we can all play a role in making our world a less dangerous, uh, less uncertain place. And again, that really is changing the world. So when you put all of this together, I hope it is clear to you that the work we do in the world of technology matters. It matters a lot, not just for Nokia, not even just for our customers or the bottom line. It matters because it is an essential part of building a world that works, a world in which people live in safety and security, a world in which poverty becomes a distant memory, a world that is peaceful and sustainable. To me, that is a promise, the possibility of what all of us can do. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.